It's good to be back before you once again. Mama and baby is doing, they're doing very well. We're thankful for the kind words and the gifts and the prayers that have been offered up. Um, they're going to be staying in for a little while till uh, uh, it gets safe for, for Maya to get out and about. So uh, we thank you so much for your kindness and your love towards us. And uh, we are thankful to be a part of such a wonderful, uh, spiritually minded congregation. Appreciate those who filled in for me, uh, Curtis and Cody Westbrook. I don't know if Cody mentioned it to you, but he has got a congregation that he is preaching for, a small congregation not far from Fruitvale. And that is his first preaching work. And as you already know, he's going to do great. He already does great. And he's just going to improve as time goes on. So we're, we're thankful to be a part of uh, helping him out in any way. A couple of Sundays ago, we started a, a lesson in a series in which we talked about giving an answer. Giving an answer. We're going to be asked questions as Christians, as members of the Church of Christ. And the Bible makes it very clear that we are to be ready to give an answer. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 was a foundation scripture upon which we based our lessons that we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and always be ready to give an answer. Some translations say, make a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. So the Apostle Peter, my inspiration says, that we are to set God apart, the Lord God, apart in our hearts, and we've got to be ready always, be ready always to give a defense or to give an answer concerning people asking us questions. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul makes a similar statement as he says, Colossians 4 and verse 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Our speech, our, our, our language should be with grace, seasoned with salt, and we need to know. Notice that word, know. We need to have knowledge that we may be able to answer each one, that we might give a defense or an answer to people who ask us concerning our hope, concerning why we are Christians, concerning why we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, concerning why we are members of the Church of Christ, concerning why we practice what we practice and don't practice what others do practice, we need to be ready to give an answer. And the last time I was with you starting this series, we looked at Jesus Christ being the only way of salvation. How that the religious leaders that claim to believe in Jesus Christ are now saying that a person could somehow have access to God and go to heaven in a way other than Jesus Christ. And we have looked from the scriptures, like at John 14 and verse 6, how Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes it very clear that he came to earth to show us the way to suffer and die, to rise again, to ascend to be our mediator, our high priest, before the Father, and it's His way, His truth, His life that we are to follow if we wish to have access to God and we wish to go to heaven. Have you ever been misrepresented? You ever have anyone say that you said something that you know you didn't say? You ever have someone say about you that you made a statement or that you believe something that you know you didn't say and you know you do not believe. Whether it be on purpose, out of malice, whether it be out of ignorance, it's not pleasant to be misrepresented. To have someone say that you said something or that you teach something that is not true. And the Lord in even His church of the first century had to endure being misrepresented. In Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24, we see that, G, that, that Paul is on trial, and Paul here is before Ananias the high priest. 
And there was an orator that came by the name of Tertullus that came to talk about Paul. To tell Annas, Ananias rather, the high priest, concerning the trouble and the problems that the Apostle Paul is creating. And notice what was said by Tertullus in verse 5, Acts chapter 24 and verse 5. For we have found this man talking about Paul, we have found this man a plague. He's a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. And he is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So this is how those on the outside of the church, those who were not believers, viewed an apostle of Jesus Christ and viewed the church. He said this person, he's a plague. And he is someone who is uh, creating dissension among the Jews. He's creating trouble with the Jews throughout the world. And he's one of those ringleaders of the sect of the Nazarenes. He's talking about the Lord's church. And he refers to the Lord's church as a sect of of the Nazarenes. Now that's not what the church called themselves. The, the early disciples did not call themselves Nazarenes. They were called Christians. Acts 11 and verse 26. In fact, according to prophecy of the Old Testament, they would be called Christians. But this is a label that someone outside the church was giving to the church. They're a sect of the Nazarenes. The word sect there means a section or a part of something. They viewed Christianity and the Lord's church as being just a section or a portion of Judaism. And as a result, this was the false accusation, this was the misrepresentation that uh, this man, Tertullius, was giving to Ananias, the high priest, concerning Paul and his work. Was Paul creating problems? He was preaching the truth. He was going around establishing congregations of the Lord's people. He was converting people to Christ. To those who resist the truth, yeah, that's creating problems. However, he was doing nothing but good in the sight of the Lord, fulfilling that great commission of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. That was the first century in which the Lord's people were misrepresented. And in the 21st century, God's people are being misrepresented once again, not only before a small court, but throughout the world. In fact, on television. In fact, on a news network that reaches the, the four corners of our globe. CNN headline news. There is a woman there that is a TV personality by the name of Nancy Grace. And on March 27th of this year, 2006, six, she was investigating Churches of Christ. And as she investigated Churches of Christ, she interviewed a Baptist preacher. She wanted to know about Churches of Christ, so she interviewed a Baptist preacher. Isn't that just like modern day journalism? Going to a Baptist preacher. And I want to give you a segment of that interview with a Baptist preacher, and they're going to talk about Churches of Christ. Nancy Grace says, I want to go uh, to Pastor Tom Rakela. Joining us tonight, a special guest, a Baptist minister. I've been researching the Church of Christ. I don't know much about it. What can you tell me? So Tom Rakela, the Baptist preacher, says, Well, the Church of Christ is a relatively new church. It was started about 150 years ago by Alexander Campbell. It's unfortunately a very legalistic sect. Sect. Does that sound familiar? Is it not, not exactly what Tertullius said about the church in Acts chapter 24 and verse 5? The sect of the Nazarenes referring to the church? It's a legalistic sect. And they tend to use intimidation and pressure tactics. They claim that they are the only ones going to heaven and all other people are condemned to hell. And Nancy Grace interrupted. She says, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But I already knew that. Now, wait a minute. What more can you tell me? Raquel uh, goes on and says, well, they claim that if you're not baptized by one of their ministers, that you're doomed to hell. 
Even if you're a believer in Christ, which of course breaks completely from the traditional Christian view that all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved because we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again. For the church of Christ, folks, that's not enough. You have to be a member of their narrow sect. You have to be a member of their narrow sect. It's a very exclusive group. And if you're not a member of their sect, you're condemned. Nancy Grace noticed he used the word sect over and over and over again. So you, pastor, you keep saying sect, sect. You make it sound like a cult. Rukela replied, it kind of is a borderline cult. Unfortunately, I don't want to make it out like some kind of Hare Krishna group. But it has cult-like characteristics. And she said, well, what in what sense? Well, in the sense that they are, they are very exclusive. In the sense of exclusivism. The attitude that they are the only ones who know the truth. The tactics which they use are sometimes just not only unbiblical, but unethical. And they can be very ungracious, unfortunately. Now, let me say this concerning the last comment. There is no excuse whatsoever for any member of the church to be ungracious or unkind or unloving in preaching the truth. That includes me or anyone here or any member of the church. There is no reason for that. Truth stands on its own as we present it exactly as it should be presented. So if someone was rude to Mr. Rakela, there, from the church of Christ, there's no, there's no excuse for that. That's wrong. That's sinful. However, you can see from this interview, we are being misrepresented. As uh, Tom Rakela, by the way, was, was contacted by faithful brethren, no one can get a hold of him. They can't find him. He won't return emails. He won't, won't return phone calls. He went on CNN headline news, which goes throughout the world and made these statements. However, he won't talk to any of us. Isn't that strange? So he refers to the church and he, he says it's narrow. We looked at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 two Sundays ago. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. In the days of Noah, it was so narrow that only eight souls were saved out of the entire population of planet Earth. Yes, narrow is the way. Jesus said that is the fact. Is it exclusive? Yes. It excludes everyone who's not willing to follow Christ. Exactly as he commanded. If you partially, sort of, kind of follow Christ, that's not going to work. You've got to do things His way in the way He has commanded, the pattern that He has given in His Word, or it will not be accepted. <clears throat> and He refers to the Lord's church as a legalistic sect. Now, I would have to ask Him what He means by legalistic. Does He mean by that we can earn our salvation? No. No, we can't earn anything. No one from the church has ever taught we can earn anything. But if he means by legalistic that we believe in keeping law, guilty as charged. Galatians 6 and verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Yes, there is a law that we are to keep. And in keeping that, we don't earn a thing. We just receive that free gift of salvation that he has promised, salvation is conditional and we must meet the conditions that God has laid down in his word. And when one person does that or a group of people do that, they become Christians and they become the Lord's church. Now, concerning Alexander Campbell and the founding of the church of Christ. Remember what he said, Alexander Campbell founded the church of Christ a hundred and fifty years years ago. Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 18. The reason why this is said, and you will find this in dictionaries, you will find this in encyclopedias, you will find this in websites that are speaking about the church of Christ. The reason is they don't want to allow the church of Christ to be anything more than a denomination. Because if they admit that it is the Lord's body, the Lord's church, 
then they're admitting the denominations that they're in are unauthorized and they shouldn't be in them. They shouldn't exist. So they have to reduce the church of Christ down on the level of denominationalism. But what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18? Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What is my identity? And so they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. You're just like those prophets of old. You preach straightforward like they did. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, verse 15, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Asking his closest disciples. Simon Peter, impulsive by nature, spoke up, and he answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. You share the very nature of Godhood. You are God's Son. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this uh, to you, but my Father who is in heaven, verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He says to Peter that on this rock, that's the confession that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, I, singular, one Savior, will build my singular church. Singular. One Savior, Jesus Christ. We already established that two Sundays ago. Only one Savior. To say that there is another Savior is blasphemy. He is the way, the truth, the life. Now this one Savior who is the way, the truth, the life said, I will build my church, singular. He didn't say churches, plural. He did not say denominations. My church. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia means a called out of an assembly of people, called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Those who have been saved by His grace and mercy are part of this grand assembly known as the church. And He said, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Keep that in mind. And in the, in the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we see that that fulfillment took place as he promised that he would establish his church. Notice, as we looked at Matthew chapter 16, Christ would build his church. It is the church that belongs to Christ. The church of Christ. He doesn't use the phraseology there. But it's clear. The church, the called out assembly of people, of that which belongs to and derives from Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And in Acts chapter 2, that was fulfilled. 3,000 on that day obeyed the gospel, believing in all their heart in Christ, and obeying that gospel, being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, they were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Those who believed and obeyed the gospel were added to the church daily. And you notice there it's in a singular form. Jesus said, I will establish my church. And that church was established in Acts chapter 2, the year 33 A.D. of the first century. It was the church that belonged to Christ. Therefore, logic concludes that the church of Christ was established in the year 33 A.D. on the day of Pentecost of the first century. That's a long time before Alexander Campbell. A long time. And as the church began to spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, those churches were called, Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, churches of Christ. Churches that belong to Christ. Now I want you to think with me. Use your imagination for a moment. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 people had been baptized into Christ. What if Nancy Grace got into a time machine? She went back to the day of Pentecost in the year 33 AD. She stepped out of that time machine and she began to interview one of those Jews there on the day of Pentecost. And she goes up and she asks this question to one of those Jews. 
Which denomination did you join? I'd say, excuse me? Which, which church did you join? Which denomination did you join? I said, what are you, what are you talking about? Because the concept of denominationalism was not even there. The church was established. It was the church that belonged to Christ. They would not know what she was talking about. Now think of this scenario, how ridiculous this would be. What if those 3,000 on the day of Pentecost were divided up into three denominations? You have one of the apostles say, okay, this group of 1,000 here, you're going to be Baptist. This group of a thousand here, you're going to be Methodist. And this group of a thousand here, you're going to be Catholic. And Peter, you can be the head of that group as the first pope. Well, any historian of any denominational background would look back on that and say, that's ridiculous. However, that is the concept that we are told that we're supposed to have today of Christianity. And that is false to the core. As the denominational pastor was interviewed, he has that concept. And therefore, as he looks at the church of Christ, he wants to say, well, they're this sect of Christianity. They're only a section of Christianity. He can't bring himself to see the church as it really should be seen through the eyes of the scripture. You know, denominationalism tried to get started in the first century. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There were those in the city of Corinth who wanted to divide the church into various groups. And Paul, by inspiration, wrote to them and said, This is not right. This is contrary to God's will. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. He said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And he goes on to talk about how they're dividing up into these groups. And he asks the question, is Christ divided? The answer to that is no. And in chapter 3 and verse 3 of the same book, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 3, Paul says, for you are still carnal. That's not a compliment. He says, you are still carnal, you're fleshly minded. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? And behaving like mere men. He says that is carnally minded to have division. And the very definition of denomination is division to denominate something. is to divide it. And Paul says that's carnally minded. <coughs> that is sinful. You are to speak the same things. You are to have no divisions. And you are to be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. We won't take the time to read the book of Ephesians but when you read that book over and over and over again, you see how it is emphasized that the church is one. One new man in Christ. One body. Only one church over which Jesus Christ is head. All that information predates Alexander Campbell by a long time. The church of Christ is not a sect or a denomination. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. He prayed a long prayer. And in the midst of that prayer, he prayed that his followers would be one, not divided up into sectarian groups or denominations. But they are to be one. The church of Christ is not a sect. It is not a denomination because it seeks to restore and maintain the church that Jesus established. And if it can be proven, and it already has from Scripture, that Alexander Campbell did not start the Church of Christ, then it's already proven that the Church of Christ is not a sect or a denomination. When we or any group of any age follow the pattern of the New Testament, we will be what they were. That's why we're Christians. That's why we call ourselves the Church of Christ at Roy City. Because of Romans 16 and verse 16. We call ourselves Christians because of Acts 11 and verse 26. That's what they were called. We pattern our worship after the blueprint. After the seed, which is the word of God. Luke 8 and verse 11. When you have a seed of a plant 
and you plant that seed, you have the DNA of that plant in that seed, and it will reproduce after its kind. That's the law that God created in the natural world in Genesis chapter 1. And when this seed, the word of God, the true gospel, is preached and planted, and people believe and obey it, you have the true church of Jesus Christ. Not a denomination. Not some sort of sectarian group. I believe the case has been made, but let me give you some further evidence. I want you to remember something. Alexander Campbell was born in 1788, and he died in 1866. I want you to remember that year, 1788. That's the year that Alexander Campbell was born in Ireland. 1788, remember that year. And I'm going to give you just two examples. There's numerous examples. And remember, the accusation is made. And when people make this accusation, they're going based upon history books or encyclopedias or some research done in some sort of website. They say, Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ. Remember, he was born in 1788. History tells us that there was a Church of Christ in Morrison Court, Ireland. That congregation was established between 1772 and 1782. Now when was Alexander Campbell born? 1788. And yet history tells us that in Ireland there was a church of Christ established sometime between 1772 and 1782. In the United States of America, Revere, Massachusetts, there is a historical marker that reads this way. Church of Christ, 1710. And now on this historical marker, it's talking about a building there. Meeting house of the Church of Christ in Romney Marsh. Erected, the building was built in 1710. Thomas Cheever was the first settled minister. There was a Church of Christ there. The building was built. The name of the first minister, the preacher there, is given in 1710. That's 78 years before Alexander Campbell was born. How can that be if he started the church of Christ? And as I said, this is just a sampling of evidence from history that shows, remember what Jesus said? The gates of Hades would not prevail against the church. It would never be destroyed. In Daniel chapter 2, it is called a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And it was, it was established in Acts chapter 2, in the year 33 A.D., and it's been here ever since. Oh, it may be in the vast minority, overshadowed by false religion. But Jesus said, it would never be destroyed. Also, it could go out of existence within a given region. It could go out of existence within a country. However, any place in the world where people say, let's just be Christians... And that's all Alexander Campbell did. He came out of the Presbyterian denomination and called people along with others like him in the Restoration Movement saying, let's go back to the Bible and let's just follow this. And when you read Alexander Campbell's writings, he's making it very clear. I don't want to start a new church. I want to go back to the original. I follow that. So to accuse him of starting something is false. Perhaps unethical, perhaps out of ignorance, maybe it's out of malice, perhaps people just don't know. But a long time before these historical markers, and this history shows churches of Christ in the United States before Alexander Campbell, in Europe, throughout the world, Romans 16, 16 still said the churches of Christ greet you. Brethren, we must give an answer. We must show forth the evidence because people are going to say this about us. It's already been said nationwide, worldwide on CNN headline news. And we have to be ready to give an answer concerning these false accusations and to show from the Bible and even sometimes from plain history the facts of the matter. This morning, you can be a member of this church. We're not going to vote on you. We're not going to ask you to join us Because really you can't join the Lord's church. 
God adds you to the church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. But you have to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. So why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you've done that, you've gone back into darkness, you've gone back into sin, we urge you to repent. As always, the choice is yours while we stand, while we sing.